Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Will you bow your heads with me in prayer, please? Gracious Lord, we give you great thanks for this beautiful day that you have created and allowed us to share in. Take our minds, Lord, and think through them. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So I have to admit, Kyle, it's a little weird. Kyle and I have been on this journey together for uh, seven months, and he usually sits right here, and the camera's right here, and now there's no camera, and there's no Kyle, and I can barely see him back there. I feel like, you know, you dropped me off at preschool for the first day. Um, it's weird. I'm so used to looking right at the camera, but we'll get by. Um, last week, we, uh, we talked about symbols, symbology, the idea that there are things in our world, in our lives, in our church, which act as symbols, symbols which point to a deeper truth and a deeper reality that we can't usually see or understand. Symbols work to make the inexpressible expressible, the immaterial, material. But in the church, we still may come to a rough and difficult question at times, maybe more often than we should, more often than we can. The question, how do we have a relationship with a living God who we cannot see? Symbols all around us, but we do not see God. So how does the impossible to see God become possible, to know God? How does that impossibility become possible? Well, for a little help today, I went to that classic of Christian help, of course, uh, the story of Alice in Wonderland. You'll maybe remember this little um, story part. It's a conversation between the queen and Alice the queen says, how old are you? And she says, I'm seven and a half exactly. You needn't say exactly, the queen remarked. I can believe it without that. Now I'll give you something to believe. I'm just 101, five months and a day. I can't believe that, said Alice. Can't you? The queen said in a pitying tone. Try again. Draw a long breath and shut your eyes. Alice laughed. There's no use trying, she said. One can't believe in possible things. The queen responded, I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was younger, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Now that's from the book, and of course there are multiple movies of Alice in Wonderland, but the one that I am more intrigued with is the most recent with Johnny Depp, whether you like it or not, I'm not sure if you've seen it or not, but you've heard of Alice in Wonderland. And in that movie, she actually expands on these six impossible things. 
as she's about to fight the Jabberwocky, this crazy dragon looking thing at the end of the movie, she's hyping herself up. She's getting all warmed up and she reminds herself of this conversation. And so as she's preparing to fight, she starts listing the six impossible things that she knows of. There's a potion that can make you shrink and a cake that can make you grow. Animals can talk. Cats can disappear. There is a place called Wonderland. I can slay the Jabberwocky. Now, Lewis Carroll, as many of you know, is a little bit crazy. Um, and these kind of stories are great places to see the impossible become possible. And for Alice, that happened. You notice that all these impossible things that she listed actually became real, became possible. She did all of those things or saw all of those things. Things that we would suggest are impossible in her story become possible. And so she learns that. As human beings, of course, that is the idea of seeing is believing, right? It's kind of like a Christmas thing. A, well, not a Christmas thing, Santa Claus thing. But sometimes we are confronted with a reality that we see and we still think it's impossible. This is an often found thing in our lives. It's more of an excited kind of question. You can also see it in movies. And as I've told people at the last two services, you're getting three movie references today for the price of one because I haven't used any in like five months and they've been kind of building up. So we talked about Alice. But there are a couple movie references I'd like to bring out to tease out this idea of impossible. So the first one, Empire Strikes Back, a Star Wars movie. If you haven't seen it, at least you know about it. Maybe some of you know about Luke Skywalker. My probable cousin played his role, Mark Hamill. Eventually, I'm going to bring in my brother Sean's high school picture, and you're going to put it next to Mark Hamill, and you're going to go, you are actually related. It's, it's creepy. Anyway, in Empire Strikes Back, Luke, who plays the good guy, is fighting his soon to find out his dad, Darth Vader, who's the bad guy, and they're, they're going at it, sword fighting, and Luke gets his arm cut off, and he's flailing in pain, and Darth Vader tells him the news. I'm your father, Luke. And Luke responds, no, it can't be. It's impossible. That moment of confusion and excitement when something that seemingly is impossible is right in front of you can't be real. Another one is from the movie The Never Ending Story, which some of you have seen, some of your grandkids have seen, some of your kids have seen. I rewatched it a couple years ago. It wasn't as good as I remembered it. It's fun, but it's really cheesy. Anyway, that aside, the main character is Bastion. And Bastion finds this amazing book, and he takes off school, and he goes into the attic, and he reads this book, and he finds out as he's reading the book that the book's kind of doing strange things. Things are happening that are almost becoming real. In fact, at one point, the princess in the book who's trying to save this world she lives in says in the book Bastion's name, that he's going to help them. And the, the story cuts from inside the book to the princess and all of her friends to back to Bastion, and he just heard his name in a book that he's reading. And you know what he says? That's impossible. Of course it's impossible. Have any of you read a book where the person in the story started talking about you? No. It's impossible. Again, that shock and that excitement and that overwhelming idea that something that could never happen is happening. Now, I use these three examples on purpose because they all come from a similar genre, kind of science fiction fantasy. Not unlike myths and fairy tales and legends, this genre is known for making the impossible possible. That's one of its enchanting powers. That's why I love fantasy books, because where else can you see dragons and elves and wizards and all this stuff? It's fun, because you don't see it in reality. But there's an interesting thing. If you know about mythology and literature, those who teach it and study it will tell you something. That these kind of stories, myths, legends, fairy tales, fantasy though they seem impossible and unreal, always have some sort of truth underlying them. There's a lesson to be learned. The implication is, though the story seems impossible and totally unreal, that you, the reader, as you are reading it, are in fact learning a lesson, and by learning a lesson, your reality 
changes. And so the impossible story has an actual effect on your possible reality, from a book to reality. But there's another thing inherent in all of these examples. And if you look at Alice and Luke and Bastion, if you look at the things that were impossible, Alice's list, Darth Vader being his father, Bastion saving the princess, you'll notice something very interesting. That the character who was professing the impossibility is actually in contact, direct interaction with the impossible. They learn that the impossible things are possible because they've actually been in contact with them. They've seen them. They know them. We have another word for this. When two things are in direct contact and interaction, the impossible and the character come like this. And a word we use for that is relationship. The impossible in these stories becomes possible because those who don't believe the impossible come into contact, relationship, and then the possible happens. So I submit to you that one of the core foundation principles of how the impossible becomes possible is because of direct relationship between the impossible and you. So how do we have a living relationship with a God who we can't see, which seems impossible? Well, there must be some sort of relationship. So today, in our epistle from Paul to the Philippians, chapter 4, we see Paul begin to speak about this. Not begin, but to elaborate on this. He's always talking about it. And here we see him do a list, not unlike Alice, of impossible things. We hear these things. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Do not worry about anything. Oh, that, that's the winner right there. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will, be made, uh, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The God of peace will be with you. Rejoice always. Be gentle to everyone. Don't worry about anything. God's peace will be with you. These are impossible things. And like Bastion and Luke, some of us in our brains or out loud or out in the internet world might be going, those are impossible. Have you been outside lately? Have you been on the news or watched your social media or heard your friends talking at the coffee shops? I can't rejoice always. I can't not worry. I can't be gentle with everyone. And I certainly don't feel any peace. And all of us go, no. It's not true. It's impossible. But if the impossible can become possible through relationship, then maybe something is happening. The words of Jesus. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And here Paul and Jesus, and now me reiterating it, are talking about these things, not because they're impossible, but clearly because they are. So how do they become possible? Thank you, Paul. Let's get back to him. We hear him say this. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, if there is any excellence in this, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things you have learned and received and heard and seen me. How does the impossible become possible? How does rejoicing always, being gentle with everyone, not worrying and having the peace of God, how the heck is that even possible? Paul tells you, by submitting everything to the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving, not your victories, not your happy moments, not your excelling in your job and your family. Everything. Is that big enough? I could yell, but I don't want to hurt my throat. Everything. God wants to be talking to you all the time. He wants to know all of your troubles, all of your dreams, all of your hatreds, and he wants to hear it in prayer. That's when we communicate with God. And when you communicate with somebody, you are, by definition, doing what? Having a relationship. Also, it's nice to give him thanks. He did create you and give you life and give us beautiful worship spaces. Thanksgiving is important, but give everything to God by prayer. 
The second part that Paul notes, he lists these characteristics that aren't really ours. They are God's, right? Being just, honorable, pure, what is commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. These are godly characters. And how do we get to be a part of that? By thinking on them. That's right. You heard it here. God actually wants us to use our minds. But where do we hear those words? Where do we learn about them? Where do we interact with them in a relationship? In Holy Scripture. When you study and read, you're not only interacting with God, you're coming to learn about who God is and these characteristics. And then God wants you not to just put the book down and go, okay, I'm off to work. Okay, I'm off to take care of the kids. Okay, I'm retired now. God wants you to keep the words and the lessons you have learned in your relationship with Christ in the scriptures, and he wants you to think on them. We'll start at 10 seconds, but five minutes or 30 minutes or most of the day would probably be better. It's an ongoing relationship with God. So we have praying and we have thinking. But that's what we do here. And as you know, the liturgy, as I've repeatedly reminded us, is not just about praying and thinking about God here. What do we do at the end of the service? We walk out the doors. And so he says, keep on doing the things you have learned and received and heard and seen, and the God of peace will be with you. You take the prayers and the thanksgivings and the relationship that builds. You take the scripture and the things and the characteristics of God that you have studied and learned, and you meditate them on, and you breathe on them, and you digest them, and you ingest them, and you marinate in them, and then you take them out in the world, and you do the things they just taught you. To be gentle, to praise, to worship, to love, to forgive, to be merciful. To everyone. I'm going to say this every week until November 2nd. Everyone. Everybody is worthy of your love and forgiveness and your mercy and your gentleness and your praise. Why? Not because you like them or not, because they are created in God's image. And because when we act like that, we are making the impossible possible. How do we have a relationship with a living God who we can't see by Praying, thinking, and doing. Doing what Paul has taught and the apostles have taught and the disciples have taught and the church has taught for 2,000 years coming out of Christ. That a relationship with God by our faith in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, God comes within us because we have invited him in and then we have a relationship with him. And then slowly things begin to happen. We really slowly learn that we can kind of rejoice almost always. And we can kind of almost not worry about things. Why? Because it's great out there? Because I don't really care about it? Because I think I love what's going on in the outside world right now? No. Because Christ walks with me in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the battle, because he is steering my course, and I trust that even though all this thing is, that is going out in the world is terrible and oppressive and sad, Christ is with me. And so I can rejoice and I can worry. Probably not fully not worry, but less and less. Let's have goals. And I can then begin to give my gentleness and my love to everyone, even those people I hate. And I can expect that the peace of God will be within my life. Why? Because it's our love and peace? What are we, Alice? If I hold my breath and close my eyes really hard and try, I can really love that person who's a different party of the politics than me. And I can really, really love my neighbor who's done all those terrible things to me all of these years. No! Because by a growing relationship in the Lord, the Holy Spirit transforms you, and the impossible becomes possible. You begin to be gentle and loving with everybody. You begin to feel this peace not because you're glad about what's going on in the world, but because God is literally with you. How do I know this? One last thing. Paul uses a special word here at the end, and you've heard this before. In fact, you'll hear it later in the service. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God. That comes from this passage today. And he says this word, guard your hearts and minds. And this word guard is very important because in Greek, Guard, the word in Greek, means military guard. Strange, right? It's not a fence. 
It's not just standing in front of, it's a military word, which means it's a war word, which means what is Paul doing, ironically? He's saying you will receive God's peace, where? In the midst of the war and the battle that you are fighting and that you are struggling through. Doesn't take it away, doesn't end it. He walks with you and he covers you in his peace. Why? Well, we just talked about how the spiritual impossible becomes possible, and now the material impossible becomes possible. I can walk out that door, and in the next three weeks, while the country goes crazy, I'm not happy, but I have a sense of peace because I know my Lord is with me. I know he is steering my direction. I know that I still have love and forgiveness to give. This guarding of our hearts is a symbol of peace in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the war. It's not the peace where you're like, look at this, I'm retired, I don't have any worries, I've got enough money, everybody loves me, oh my God, peace. No, it's military peace guarded by an army of the Lord so that you can get through your day and get through the next couple months until we can take all these silly masks off. So we can make it through the political anger. So we can love our neighbor. The impossible becomes possible. Don't take my word for it. Maybe don't even take Paul's word for it. You can definitely take Jesus' word for it. This is how we have a living relationship with a God we can't see. By thinking, praying, and doing what he has given to us through the scriptures, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, and the tradition of the church. And when we walk in that, the impossible not only are spiritualized, but are materialized becomes more possible. And we grow more and more to be like Jesus Christ himself so that the world can know that Jesus is Lord. To the glory of God, now and forever. Amen.